Welcome everyone to the next philosophy class. Uh, normally we have Dr. Craig Wright here teaching uh, these classes, but today he's still busy and we have our moderator, Brendan Lee, who will be taking lead. Uh, this class will be focusing on a review of the last three classes of Nald Roots and discussions and questions for us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, and over to you, Brendan. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, so today we are going through, as Joel, Joel said, the last three sections of Nald Roots. Um, and those are Greco-Romanic Christianity, um, an origin of terms and, uh, oh, actually, I think I've got these in the wrong order. Hang on a second. Uh, Sorry, guys. What is the order of these? I'm looking in the philosophy channel. So anyway, I think a good place to start is with um, that Greco-Romanic Christianity, because I thought that that class opened up some very interesting questions around uh, how the church views women and how that view has kind of affected the role of women within society and, you know, how a lot of the current narrative that we see today around feminism and the rights of women uh, was really set up over the last several hundred years and uh, has now become, you know, something quite, uh, you know, actually, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it, it's become a real point of contention in society about, about what is the role of women? Uh, are they equal? And in, in equality, what do we even mean by that? And and so the questions I I'd, I'd like to put to people today is, you know, what does equality between men and women really mean? And because I think that we can absolutely make the case that men and women are not the same. And I think. I think a lot of what is out there is is trying to say, oh no no no, they are, and and they should have, they should, uh, you know, have the same everything and be looked at in the same way, and and we we shouldn't actually treat them as different. I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, I think from a legal standpoint, absolutely, you know every person should be treated the same by law uh you know and we should have the same rights and the same opportunity but that doesn't necessarily mean that we should all be pushed down the same pathway and um i'd like to ask you guys what you think uh about the different roles that men and women tend to choose within society. Uh, I, I've seen um, a, a couple of really great um, monologues by Jordan Peterson talking about how in the societies that we have today, in particular Scandinavia, where they've really done what I think is a good job of, of equalising the playing field and saying, actually, we're going to give, we're going to make, no difference between men and women. We're going to have no pay gap. You know, everything, everybody will be treated the same. There's actually, in, in those countries, there's actually been a real divergence of the things that men choose to do versus the things that women choose to do. And so when given the same sets of options and... Uh, the same level of opportunity, it's really the difference in personality between masculine and feminine that allows people to then demonstrate that actually 
we're not the same and we want different things and we evaluate the world through different lenses and that results in us choosing different paths and acting in different ways and reacting very differently uh, to the same situations. And yes, so, we're different but complementary to one another. Absolutely. We, we, we need each other. The feminine and the masculine other. go together. That's right. Um, you know, you, you can't actually have uh, a society without both sides. You know, you need, you need a man and a woman to make children and, and really everyone who is here on this earth today was created by a man and a woman together. Um, and it, it, it's very interesting to see that, uh, these, this, uh, push to say, well, no, actually you can just choose to be whatever you want to be. And this whole idea of gender is a fake thing that is a construct of, of the mind. And I, I don't believe that at all. Um, I think, you know, there are are very obvious physical differences between men and women. Uh, only women have the capability to grow a child inside them and to give birth to that child. Uh, you know, only women have the the mechanisms to feed a baby milk. Uh, and, you know, that forms uh, a, a very strong bond, you know, in, in fatherhood, you have to do a lot more work to form a bond with your children, I think, than than a woman uh, does. I think the bond between mother and, and child is is very, very natural. Um, however, you know, there are millions of cases where children have grow up without a father and, and, and far less cases where children grow up without a mother. And um, I think that's a really interesting factor that, that we can look at, you know, that as a, as a father, why is it that, uh, that there isn't that, uh, that same bond if we, if we were to say that we're all the same? Um, any thoughts on that? Um, I was thinking that we need to appreciate that God has created the differences between us and that they, like I was saying, are complementary and they go very well together. Um, we should be treated equal under the law and seen and given equal respect in the eyes of the law, society, and God. But the differences need to be acknowledged and appreciated um, Absolutely. So a lot of times they try to equalize things by trying to make everything the same. And it there needs to be value in both. Women shouldn't be going to war really in childbearing ages and being part of the draft. The reason for that is you end up with society collapses. Mm -hmm. I think, um, what was it? I have notes here where Craig was talking about... Um, uh, older women were allowed to go to war. What was that in Nordic societies? I think. Right, but they had to be older because when they're a childbearing age, they have to hold that, down the, the society while the men go and go to war, defend the society. They have to raise the next generation of uh, people who are going to keep things going. And right. if you. If you take that away, if you take away that next generation, if you take away the desire to have children and to raise a family, then you do end up with societal collapse. If you don't have anyone to replace the outgoing generation, then actually that's a disaster because there's nobody to grapple with uh what comes down um and i think i think actually a lot of western societies are 
in that situation. Well, not just Western, uh, Eastern societies like China, Japan, Korea, they are actually in an even worse situation with regards to birth rate than a lot of Western countries. And a lot of Western countries are in a really bad situation. And I see here in Australia, um, I mean, let, let's ignore the current uh, influx of migrants in the US. Prior to, to all of this um, border problems that they've been having, they were making up the majority of their population increase by bringing in migrants. And Australia is the same. Um, we actually aren't having children at a fast enough rate to replace uh, the adults who are leaving the workforce, um, so retiring and or, you know, passing away. And what uh, that is actually going to create is a, a massive uh, vacuum in terms of capabilities, in terms of society's ability just to function and to feed itself. And uh, it's a pretty it's a pretty bad situation, and I don't I don't uh, you know to me while I see that what a lot of the church has done in in trying to really take women out of the discussion and really force them into a box where they should be quiet and where the men make the decisions and only men can be educated and only men can make decisions around how things function. You know, that, that to me is, is a negative aspect of, of all of uh, this kind of uh, division of the sexes, but this kind of, we've overcorrected in, in a lot of ways. And, you know, we're told that, um, you know, actually for women, it's more important to have a career and to uh, earn money than it is to have a family and uh, earn the next generation for our society. And and really, I, I see the having of a family, you know, that's as, as important as... Uh, or it pros- you know even more important than growing your career and um, you know I think my wife would probably hit me if she heard me saying that but um, yeah you know really if we're all focused on our job and turning up at eight a.m. every day and earning money to buy things and have. Uh, a life that we're shown on TV that we want to have and nice clothes and all this stuff, there becomes very little room in that space for the creation of a family, which uh, I see a lot of material on social media that talks about, oh, you know, how bad it is to have kids and how much stress it puts on you and uh, how it changes your life. And yes, absolutely, it changes your life, but you have to be ready for that change and to kind of roll with it. And it's when you roll with it and you look at it as an opportunity to create someone new to or, or, or new people, multiple new people. I've got two kids um, and seeing them grow up and getting to know them and seeing their personalities develop and teaching them about the world has been to me far more rewarding than any job I've had or, you know, career opportunities. Um, And 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 the hardships of making children and caring for them and becoming selfless creates growth and when you don't go through those types of hardships and and having to provide it it limits the growth oh yeah absolutely earning a living to look good on social media 
isn't the same type of growth and character development that you get when you sacrifice for someone else. Same, even if it's just in a marriage, say yeah. no children come of it. You sacrifice because you don't get to have your way all the time. You have to learn compromise. Yeah. And it's, it's crucial. And, and I appreciate these classes in that I think it helps clarify and it gives moral guidance in how to find that balance and how to mm -hmm. find forgiveness and selflessness. And that's what makes, uh, I, I notice Christianity so effective is it works. The lessons work when applied. Mm. I think the, the, the people that you see on social media that put out this material saying it comes with lots of hardships and you lose freedom. I think they are not uh, talking about the whole picture. What I've noticed, the love that it brings, that you mm. get, is immense. And mm. don't even mention that. And it's so huge and so incredibly beautiful and, and, and rewarding. Mm -hmm. and I think if you put things into balance, you would have at least a fairer view to make a decision. But I don't see that indeed. And I guess you have no. to take the leap I, <laughs> or so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll never forget when, when my wife gave birth to our first child um, and it was not easy. She had to have an emergency C-section. And so they, they got the baby out and they handed him to me and I was sent off into another room just with myself and the baby. I remember vividly this feeling that my whole brain was rewiring itself and now every decision I made would now be focused around the baby and I was no longer the, its number one concern anymore. And and that that stayed. That wasn't something that when I left the hospital I just went back to being about myself you know, it's since that day, it, it's been 100% about making decisions for the whole family um, with the kids being the number one priority. And, um, you know, I think, I think part of the problem today is that we've lost the understanding of what happiness is. And actually, this is one of the things I'm... Uh, one of my biggest takeaways from these classes that we've been doing is, is the whole idea of happiness. Like what is happiness? It's not uh, looking to have joy all the time. And I think part of what's happening today is that people want, they want to be, they want to feel happy all the time. And so they will only do the things that they think they're going to enjoy in the moment and there's no sort of delayed gratification and this is something that we're losing very quickly uh in in humanity and i'm not just talking in the west i'm talking across across the whole world people are losing the idea that you have to work towards an end and that end is is happiness And that doesn't mean that the journey is happy. The journey is bloody hard. Like, and you have to sacrifice a lot and you have to work hard and you have to take things that you want to do now that you know you're going to enjoy and you have to put them to the side and you have to do the hard things so that in a year, five years, 20 years, you'll be able to look back at those times and go, I put that aside, but that enabled me to get to here and where I'm genuinely happy and I can look back at what I've created as a family, as an impact on society, and I can be proud of that achievement and I can be happy about what I've done. And I think it, it's that's that's a lesson that uh, we need to start teaching people again uh, because if we don't have that, if nobody's able to delay gratification, we end up in a society where 
we're just looting the future. Right. An abundance of earthly delights does not build character, but labor does. That's right. Struggle builds it. And we, and we have to, otherwise we stagnate. Yeah. Very right. And then right. And, back and to your, through labor. Oh, go ahead. No, well, okay. Then coming back to your initial point about equality between both sexes and also equity, uh, I think uh, Craig does a great job there in, in going back to uh, going uh, to the roots of where it all started going wrong and uh, why this concept. <laughs> Uh, where did it all come from? It was the Bible. It was, and he concluded that it was not so much the Bible, and it was the interpretations of the Bible. And then he he goes uh, to uh, Tertullian or John Chrysostom or other authors of the of the time that interpreted the the Bible in the wrong way to to their own benefit, and then that created a whole um, a, a whole variety of things that were wrong and need to be mm-hmm. right, uh, did need to be corrected. And, and I agree with you in the, in the sense that we, that is not the way to correct the pendulum, to go all the way to the other side, and, mm-hmm. uh, but we need to correct it. And then and with language, and uh, I agree with him, there was, that was something that I did not, back in the, in the, in the days, I did not think that uh, uh, being uh, changing firefighter uh, instead of fireman was uh, something uh, that was Im- so important. But uh, then after after a while, th- I thought maybe, uh, yeah, th- there is a point there. I mean, with small steps and just writing th- some wrongs, we can slowly go to a, uh, a middle ground where we, we, don't th- we don't talk about these things uh, and we talk about what is important, uh, w- which was w- what you were talking just about a few minutes ago. Leslie, what do you think about changing fireman to something else and not firewoman, for example? Does it affect you? To give it a gender neutral term? Well, yeah. in the beginning, I I kind of agreed with Carlos. I thought, what what does any of this matter? I, yeah, fine. We'll call it a fireman, firewoman. But I guess I can appreciate keeping it neutral, firefighter. Um, it's as long as it's not coming from a politically charged place, I'm fine with it, but it's fine. I I think it's good to just firefighter works. I Um, I mean, I I think if a woman grows up and all I've ever wanted to be is a firefighter, they should be allowed to be a firefighter. Uh, You know, I'm not against that at all, but I, I kind of, you know, they still need to be supported in uh, having a family and and growing society. And they can do that and be a firefighter. I mean, it, it, there's some risk that comes with being a firefighter, obviously. Um, but, you know, my wife has a job. And she's had that job uh, throughout growing children and... and uh, you know, I'm actually very thankful for her job because without her job, I wouldn't have been able to pursue this career in 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 uh, Bitcoin. And you know, I've depended on her salary for a lot of the time that I've been doing this. And um, so, it, it it yeah, it's absolutely about that pendulum. And and so, Craig made a very good point that you know it was back in in kind of the 14th 15th century where they sort of clamped down on the right of women to be educated and to have a voice and i think that was that was really a, a big mistake and because women are 50% of the society and they they need to have a voice and they need to be able to have a say in the direction and we took that away from them um what i think is the mistake that we're making now is that we're saying their voice is the same as our voice and and it should have no difference and i think actually what we need is both sides we need the voice of the men and the voice of the women 
And we need to recognize that they're two different voices in the conversation. And it's not just one babbling mess, but it's a conversation between the two sides about how do we move forward and how do we create an environment that fosters the greatest opportunity for achieving that long-term happiness. Right. It shouldn't be gender based as the defining point. It should be merit based. And going back to the firefighter thing, I agree. Uh, If my house were on fire, I don't want a small woman showing up to carry my nearly 200 pound husband out of the building. You know, we're going to die going to war. I don't think she's going to be able to carry her fellow troops. I know it's not politically correct to say that, but I do believe we should have a standard. And if a woman can meet that physical standard, then, and that's her passion, then so be it. But we can't lower the merits and and lower the bar. It will destroy all of society. But yeah, yeah, and same in the church. It shouldn't have been gender-based. Jesus says women need a place in the church. He doesn't mention, he doesn't even mention the fall. Craig referred to that. He said, Jesus doesn't mention the fall. So we, there's no blame there. We, we should have equal say, but it should have merit. It should be challenged equally as well. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. And I think we've ended up in a situation where actually you, you, in a lot of cases, if you're on one side, you can't question the other side. And I, I think that's wrong. Like, it, it, and this isn't even just about gender. It, it's about you know, there are there are places where you can't question what somebody says because they're a different colour to you or, you know, because they their parents came from a different country or whatever. I, I think that's just completely wrong. You know, you should always be able to question anyone uh, and especially when the question is directly concerning their actions because their actions are on them as an individual. And it has nothing to do with who their parents were or where they were born or the color of their skin or, or what appendages they have. It's them as an individual. And if you can no longer question an individual on their actions because of some arbitrary constraint, then everyone is moving through society with one arm tied behind their back. And, um, well, actually, that's not even the case. The case is that there's one group moving through society with their arm tied behind their back while the rest can hit them with both hands. And it's, it's not a good situation and it creates a lot of fear and uncertainty. Uh, And I think this is a big part of where we're sort of losing direction in society today. It's interesting because as women have gained more equality in society, um, the, the, the treatment that they received by the cancel culture, I guess that we now it's now canceling merit. It's now canceling certain cultures. It's strange that it just won't leave completely. It just, women are getting more equal treatment and now, other groups are being attacked. I don't know what where that desire comes from, why we need to do that. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. You know, it is possible to bring one side up to the same level. You, you don't need to tear the other side down. Um, right. And I think, I think in a lot of places, this is the mistake that's being made. Uh, you know, we see it with, this rise of of socialism uh, and and people who who want to basically take away what people have created from them and have it for themselves because actually they're ineffective people who couldn't create anything on their own and really what we should be doing is teaching those people how to create and giving them the opportunity to build something that's theirs. And once they've done that, they'll realise that taking something off somebody and giving it to somebody else doesn't actually fix anything because the person that that thing is 
is handed to won't respect it and won't understand what it took to create it. Right. People don't realize that the pie grows. If something yes. becomes scarce, there can be greater innovation in other ways. So mm. we've overcome scarcity repeatedly throughout history. And maybe that's why people feel they have to tear others down. Scarcity. They don't think mm. the pie gets any bigger, but it always grows. Mm. Yeah, I think mm. also the, the culture of victimhood, it is um, like a good excuse for many people to not to do the, the big effort. Uh, bearing in mind that most people in society, we are more and more sensitive to the uh, to the sensitivities of 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 each one, and trying to to be correct and to be fair in the treatment of other of other people. So whenever they say, "Yeah, you did this because you are a racist or you are misogynist," and then it, it is like it hurts you. Like, uh, in, am I not being fair? Then they use that uh, uh, victim. Uh, I mean that that blame that blame just to 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 just to put you down and then not compete at the uh, the the same uh, um, playing field and that uh, that is also unfair and we should just fight back and say hey this is wrong and then you let's let's be fair uh, but sometimes you you yeah you, you you fear being called being blamed for something that you're not really it's not your intention so it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Looking looking at um, the the week seventeen uh, course, which is um, an origin of terms. You know, this is where Craig really got into this topic of of the roles of men and women, and talking about how in Rome, because they were such a powerful society, and they did in a lot of aspects have abundancy. You, you know, if you were a Roman citizen, you were given free food. Uh, they lost a lot of that that kind of gender-based societal role differentiation. And, in fact, they had a lot of um, kind of just loitering of people, people with nothing to do. They didn't need to do anything, and and they became bored and uh, started causing trouble. And I think we're, we're seeing a lot of that today. You know, food is so abundant. You don't, you don't need to go and till the fields to... Or, or hunt an animal to feed yourself and your family. You know, you just go down to McDonald's and give someone a piece of paper and they'll give you a, a tasty burger. And um, I think something's, uh, something's been a bit lost there. You know, we've, we've lost that connection between growing our, our bodies and the source of the, the protein that where that comes from. And um, I'm, I'm just trying to read the notes here from, from yeah, the, it, the... What you're saying about, about that, Brendan, in, in my opinion, is the fact that we are glorifying money as an end goal instead of value. So we want yeah. to increase the, 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 the amount of, the, of these pieces of paper that you're talking about instead of increasing. So having a family... That you don't well, maybe you get in some countries some pieces of paper for that actually, <laughs> but it, it's not that much. And in comparison to the actual value that this will bring to you, to your family, to your friends, mm -hmm. to the society, it's so huge you cannot put a number on that. And but mm -hmm. but we are not appreciating that value. We are instead just looking at the, the how many pieces of paper do we have? What, what some so we are glorifying money and not actual. Uh, morals, values, and, and 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 basic concepts of life. It, I don't mm. know. I don't understand how we got there. Well, yeah, I think um, capitalism, uh, you know, really, and and cap capitalism is a, a great driver of growth and opportunity, but it it can be skewed, and I think in in the current world that we live in, it has been skewed into this all-consuming thing where it's all about having money and being able to demonstrate that you have money and there's there's no need within a society where the amount of money you have is the measuring stick by which everyone 
looks at you to have a family you know why why would you want to have a family when that's only going to bring you down on the stick by which you're measured and i think having a family is its own stick you know there's a whole other measurement that we can make about somebody uh and we're taught from a very young age now that actually we shouldn't consider that and then i i look at life and go well what would i rather to be 80 years old with a lot of money and all of the material comforts i could want but alone or to be old and at the end of my life and not have any money and but have a loving family uh who know me and who i love being around of course i'm going to pick that but i think people don't even consider that anymore they're only focused on the money and uh this is a mistake that we've made over the last probably 5 600 years uh to to make that the focus it's kind of like mm. um in that chapter he talks about the parable of the talents right mm. where he gives each of his <clears throat> servants the money there are those that hoard the money and that those who grow it and he says that uh the parable serves as a metaphor for how god entrusts us with abilities and resources expecting expecting us to utilize and develop them to their full potential we have the resource we have the ability to make children and grow humanity and we should do that through capitalism it's a very efficient way to grow the pie and make more prosperity for all but the only drawback is it does challenge us to have to continue to use our willpower to overcome the comforts that we receive through that that uh, joy of capitalism and all that it gives us mm. we now have to be diligent vigilant from from becoming lazy yes And a lot of people it, have become lazy it it's really interesting isn't it like this kind of easy access to money has created a situation where we can have everything that we think we need and it it can just take our focus off the things that really as a society or, or not as a society but as a as a a kind of um, a, a race of of air breathing mammals that we need to propagate the species and do, do, we're, do, we're losing sight of that do you do you think that we are being somehow robbed of our free will if you don't want to work anymore and you become lazy and you and, and you become indulgent because well there is easy money or give away from states or or corporations even because they have a master love of money and they somehow want to control you I'm maybe speculating a little bit but in effect that's what's going on in belgium where i live you get so much money for not working that if you start working sometimes you earn less that's a real real problem uh, the, the, we are literally in economically speaking being told don't work but when you don't work you're you're you become under the orders of the one who is giving you the gifts and saying what and so you you lose your 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 so i feel people are being robbed of their free will and the bible say as this this is just said we need to to fulfill it to its highest potential so i feel there is kind of a fight a war even going on for our free will right those who haven't worked take it from us and the government redistributes redistributes the wealth and they have a lot they create a lot of lazy people and we have to appreciate corporations and those who make prosperity and not take so much from them and allow those like politicians who haven't created anything to take it and hand it out to voters to get votes because it creates a, a vicious cycle that we're now suffering 
from. Yeah, I was just going to add, which um, Leslie just said what I was just going to say, really, is that it, it seems in that, that cycle, because in the UK, it's like partially like that as well, uh, where you get uh, job, it's UBI now, not job seekers. But if you um, try and better yourself while on these benefits you try and do voluntary work you know you try and help out places or do anything at all like that they take your money away so you have to just sit on your your butt and do nothing really um and unless you do it secretly but you know then you're not supposed to do that and they, they encourage you doing absolutely nothing um unless you manage to get a well-paid job to get past that <laughs> but, um it's like you said, it's like buying photos, um, the, the way I see that model, uh, because then those people are more likely to vote for whatever government party is in power because they feel uh, that government party will keep their living style on going. Yeah, also yeah I mean, I... Yeah, sorry. Go oh, sorry, you go ahead, Carlos. Yeah, all right. No, uh, that Craig also mentioned that uh, that role of being overprotective, that paternalistic, and uh, that he said something like he that does not facilitate growth, independence, or resilience. And then that is the like maybe it comes with good intentions that that part of, of being too paternalistic. But the uh, I mean, you shoot yourself in your feet uh, because it goes the other way around. It doesn't make you strong but but rather weak instead sorry mm. yeah I, as a parent you know you always want to say yes to your kids but sometimes you you have to make the choice on their behalf and i don't necessarily see that as i, I mean i i don't think it's possible to steal someone's free will what you can do is that you can provide them with an option that is not necessarily in their best interest and you can frame it in such a way that they are very likely to choose that option and they still have to choose that option. You know, they can choose not to take the government money and to take the lower paid job and to go out and do the labour. But... A lot of people won't choose that. They will simply choose to take the money and to put their feet up and watch Netflix. And, uh, you know, I think that it's it's an interesting situation that we've created for ourselves where we actually have a whole sector of society who've never held a job, who don't know what it means to create something and... For those people, it's almost a foreign concept that somebody can invent something, create create an idea in their head through thinking and mental effort and then physically assemble a team of people to execute that idea and build a product or a service and then to sell that service and have great success. You know, they think that as soon as that person has had that great success, that they must be exploiting all of the people who they've gathered to help them bring that uh, together. And it's one of the da most dangerous ideas I see in society today is that uh, we have to limit the potential of somebody else because we are ineffective. Um and I see that everywhere today that, you know, well, if, if, you're a, if you're a successful billionaire who's built a company and created massive value and actually managed to upend an existing business model and create a, a product or service that exceeds it in every way and as a result, millions of people have decided to give you their money because they want to take advantage of the product or service that you invented and you created by building a team and directing that team to execute your vision that you shouldn't be allowed to keep the benefit that you gain from that. And actually that that has to be taken from you and distributed out to all of these people who will use it to put their feet up and watch Netflix. 
Uh, I think what you say is true, and I have I've had this these discussions for sure. And what I would like to remind in in those moments is, what if I had failed executing my vision? What if I had failed producing that service or product? Would you share the depth with me? Would you share the burden of failure with me? And it was also ah, oh, of course not. Ah. <laughs> that's not very fair <laughs> and so maybe reminded that can help too I, I think yeah I, yeah well it, said it reminds me what you said is reminds me of many similar experiences running the membership club over the years where I, as you all know it's I've, I've had my ups and downs and I've made mistakes and um, there's been constant attacks, you know, they've tried to get it shut down so many times in different methods and all of this. And um, then at various times, there's been people who've come along and told me that I have to make it, um, uh, that they want control of a membership club, that they want it a, a free for all, and that it has to be free and that I should uh the control of a membership club should be part of a group of people who run it, who, of course, these, these people want to be in that group of people who are running it. Um, and, you know, all of this, like, you've got to socialise it. You've got to, so it has to be, it's such an important thing. You can't, it can't be yours and all this. And, uh, you know, both of all, what you said is really spot on where I've, you know, I, I have gone through the ups and downs and through stuff, Um and, and yeah, n n none of them were around to share the burden when it when it was difficult. Um, but they want the reward at the end. Mm. And, mm. you know, it's, it's only a tiny membership club in comparison to like a billion dollar company or so. But I imagine that um, similar things go on throughout society. And it's it would be better if people... Um, I was talking to someone about this the other day, something similar. It would be better if people had a win-win mentality where they helped other people and in a, the way that where both people got up a step. But a lot of people have a crab mentality where they think that for them to succeed, they've got to pull down the other person. And that's kind of depressing. Um, I, I think... The majority is I uh, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to me that the majority of people nowadays are like that. Um, thankfully, I I like to think that most people we've gathered around a membership club over the years that haven't got that mentality. Maybe I'm biased. Probably I'm biased, but there we go. Uh, but you know, I've been around a lot of you for years now, and I I, I like to think I I've gotten to know um quite a few of you. Um, and it's it's. I think that if society was teaching each other, it's better to help each other that, up that step rather than pulling each other down as you're trying to climb over each other. And then society as a whole would grow better. Um, I, I I wonder, like, this is part of what Craig's been, you know, teaching us. I wonder if part of this current mentality because he, he's written you know western philosophy and psychology is heavily influenced by these ancient texts so i wonder how these ancient texts and such have influenced us to the point of or is it like because as brendan said earlier the last five to six hundred years that the ancient texts have turned to money and notes and um yeah, I, I, I wonder what has took, brought us that way. And also, uh, I mean, we, we we discuss and we see we want to go there. That's the goal we want to go over there. I'm putting my hand out of screen pro purposely because I'm in a sense of it's it's out of sight. Um, but we, we need to build the steps and teach other people how. We, I agree. We definitely need to teach because it's important to point point out that economically speaking, uh, <laughs> you can you can use their own selfish interest to motivate people because economically speaking, when they work together and they specialize and then they trade, we as Leslie said earlier, we have a bigger pie for both of us than being on our own. Literally, by being selfish and trading, you get more. So you, you can literally execute that. So it's it's a misunderstanding of economics wanting to push to put to put 
people down in order to up ourselves when actually that's not economically the best solution. It's it's a misunderstanding and, and lack of education, probably. Mm. I think I think this is a great segue into the the, the third of the um, talks that we wanted to discuss, which is this uh, comparison of the Eve and Pandora stories, where we're looking at the introduction of the idea of uh, what you might call feminine chaos into into society, and and I think. What's happened since we introduced this money measuring stick? I, to me, that's like a very male uh, or masculine ideal. You know, what what can I accumulate? What can I create? And I'm going to use that to value everything around me. And we're really ignoring the feminine side, which is uh, not what do I have right now. And really, that's what this stick is. It's what do I have now how much is coming in, whereas with the female, it, it's where am I going, what am I preparing for? And uh, it's this idea that, that uh, hope and optimism is really missing uh, from society, and this, is, this comes about through the suppression of this, uh, the feminine side of society for the last several hundred years. And I don't think that modern feminism is actually achieving the goal of bringing the idea of what is feminine back into society. It's actually taking women and saying, you need to measure yourself on the same stick. And that's not the way that it, it needs to be done. It's actually that we need to say, actually, there's a different measuring system here and we're completely ignoring it. And so we need to understand what are the benefits that having this other stick against which we can measure things by can bring to society and uh, really bringing some focus back onto that. Um, and, you know, it, it's when Craig was talking about this idea that of the feminine being brought in and, and giving us the, the ability to plan for the future, and to understand that, um, you know, there is adversity and but through that adversity we can build and grow. We've lost that idea now. As soon as anyone faces any adversity, they kind of chuck their toys out of the cot and take the free money and they just don't want to face it. And we've really lost that ability to take a bit of pain Um and it's unfortunate. And I think that, that the way these stories have been skewed uh, is, is really detrimental. And so, um, you know, Craig talks about how technology is, is really bringing uh, society closer together, but we're not yet at the point where that close togetherness is being viewed as a positive actually it's we're bringing ourselves closer together but in the way that an atom bomb brings the <laughs> the, the nuclear core close so that it explodes you know and we've got to find the elements within that core that will act as a cohesive force to maintain that togetherness and uh i think that um a big part of that is teaching people again that there is joy to be found in hardship. Um, one of the things that I've tried to do over the last couple of years is to really force myself into uncomfortable situations. So I did a, a paddleboarding trip in Cambodia where I literally packed all my luggage onto an inflatable paddleboard and went 200 kilometers down a river with nothing but what I could carry. And that was a hard trip. And there were times on that trip where I really did not want to be there. It was hot. I was sore. I was thirsty. I was hungry. But coming out the other end of that, I felt like I had grown so much just in 
recognizing that I had the capability to go to places and be without most of the things that I think that I need and be able to not just survive but really thrive and be successful in an endeavor. And, um, you know, I think, I think that's something that we should be teaching young people is that it, it's, you know, we should be wanting to, uh, oh, we lost Carlos. You know, we should be wanting to challenge ourselves. We should be wanting to create adversity in our lives so that we can grow from facing those challenges. Um, Right. And I think and because also, if, if we don't do that, the challenges that are going to be presented to us will become insurmountable because, you know, challenges grow over time. And if you don't grow with those challenges, eventually you, you just fall underneath them. Right. Well, I also think one of our greatest challenges in modern society is we have this notion I read about it in that book written on the heart, the case for modern law, but I read it a year ago. He talks about how uh, in society now it's prevalent for everyone to have their own truth. And we no longer like as religion has fallen out of favor. We no longer want to have a moral guidebook. We all want to have our own. And um, with that, when we come together in uh, situations like the internet when we have kind of a tragedy of the commons, um, we, we don't have a standard that we can all look up to and all aim to achieve. So we have to learn that there is such a thing as objective, absolute truth, and we can test whether certain things work or not. And when we test Christian principles and biblical ideas, they work. That's what helped America and Europe rise to greatness. And it's not to say that nothing should challenge that, but it should be fair. And it should be based on merit, not based on the appearance of someone or if they had their feelings hurt in the past or whatever. It, it should all be based on merit and results. So Yeah, this, this idea of my truth is the only truth is is the most crazy thing and it, and it's like anyone can invent anything that they like and then say no that's my truth well but that has no grounding in reality you know people totally you know when and it, i'm going to lean in a little bit to this whole slavery thing so you know my last name is lee my dad always told us that we were related to robert lee the the, the american general uh, I was very disappointed and, and but not surprised at all to see that in, in the last few days they ripped down a, a statue of him and uh, melted it down to create some probably horrible looking public art installation. And it's this whole idea that, um, you know, because these people did something that was completely acceptable at the time, which was to own slaves and, and let's not beat around the bush. You know, owning slaves has been a thing for thousands and thousands of years. And it was only the British and then the Americans who actually put a stop to it. And it's only in Western societies today that we, we don't see slavery. You go to many Eastern countries and African countries and slavery is openly happening and people refuse to even investigate that and to look at that and accept that actually maybe what I'm believing is not real. They just say, oh, well, these people were slavers. They were the most evil people um, and they they can't understand that actually, no, these, these are the people, the people that you're vilifying are the ones who stopped this whole thing in, in these societies. And so uh, how do you counter that? Because you, you can present these people with facts and dates and documents and proof and it's just, it's not their truth, so they won't accept it. And in fact, if you continue to fight against them, you'll be lumped in with those guys. 
and oh you're supporting slavers you know you you must be racist it's it's kind of a a crazy situation to be in where you can argue for for what factually happened and that you know actually all of these people were emancipated they were all made free uh and and but somehow they're the ones having their statues cut down and um you know we're we're actually going back and i i see people promoting stories about uh oh you know mansa musa richest man who ever lived well he was a massive slaver you know on the journey he did from uh mauritania up through egypt he had a train of some 2000 slaves following him and handing out gold and he was so rich that what he gave away actually crashed the economy of multiple countries uh so you know i think we we love to flavor things with how we think the world should be and we often do that by just chucking the facts out the window um right and that's kind of like the um eve pandora comparison eve yeah. with with the greco roman interpretation oh yes it's very similar to pandora but eve was supposed to stand on her own as a new revelation a new idea uh for women to be the the uh, dichotomy i guess it is for for men to create this this situation where it it's split the the tasks of life the hardships are split between men and women yet they go together the pandora myth is a bit different but um yeah, I was going to say something else about that, but I forgot. It'll come to me. Yeah, there was something else about the um, the Eve Pandora um, story that uh, also Craig mentioned. It was also the 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 fact that uh, uh, I mean she he lauded them, saying that it was like uh, they represent humanity's per perennial desire for knowledge and the unforeseen co uh, consequences. And uh, it reminds me also how the the unforeseen consequences uh, of doing what is right and doing uh, and seeking knowledge and uh, looking, I mean, going, uh, uh, stretching uh, the best out of you. And I mean, it gives you a, like a whole field of, uh, of possibilities that it is that you make the, the the best out of of life, and that's that, that should be rewarding, and that should be uh, pushing you. When he also mentioned that, uh, I mean, the, the risks of immortality that uh, it should spur you to to do better and to uh, to to realize that we only have just a certain amount of time in this earth, and that you should do uh, something about it, and and you should learn so that you have you can have responsibility and do. Uh, and and do things for the world so that it it, it, it it's it, I mean you you get you get a a better world out of it of of it while you were on this earth. I, I want to add in as well that even you know there, there's the philosophy that once we're dead we're dead and so we there's ghosts or whatever but there's also the philosophy of the philosophy that uh, we come back in one way or another and. With that one in mind, it's even more important to make a better life of yourself to do good, uh, so that if if by any chance, because we we don't absolutely know about life and death at, at this time, but if by any chance there is people do come back or some of us do come back, you don't want to come back to a shithole. Oh, excuse my French. You don't want to come back to like a a bad place, uh, which is your fault, uh, not. Because, you know, maybe because you made, helped make it a bad place or maybe because you did absolutely nothing uh, to make it any better. And, um, you know, you, you come back 500 years, 100 years, however long in the future, and the world you come back to is is not a nice place, you know. And, and the, the further I feel we go down into the darkness of humanity, into a, a worse world, the harder it is to climb back up again. Uh, there's, you know, so if if we're all doing good work for the next 500 years and someone, you know, perchance comes back in 500 years, then the world will be a much better place than if people are doing nothing or if people are doing bad things. And um, it's 
with that mentality as well, it's not just, and the, the ancients used to have this, it's not just whether or not you're coming back or not, but also building for your grandchildren and their children and so on, so that in the 500 years, the world will be a better place. Um, I, I think a lot of the things, a lot of the things people have built are meant to last for a long time. But I think as well, what Brendan was saying earlier on about um instant gratification versus delayed gratification there is a lot of instant gratification nowadays um and i'm i mean i'm not sure how to challenge that apart from you know the edu- as we've been talking about educating people and basically teaching people that there is a better way and it's it's rewarding to do the better way even if it means working instead of sitting on your bum um working and delayed gratification uh through this working stuff is more rewarding than sitting on your bum and just waiting for someone to give you a paycheck um but yeah it's 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 people ask because i'm glad Brendan brought up the slavery point as well because um, the conversation I have sometimes with someone I know, I sometimes bring up Bitcoin to this person, and um, you know, and sometimes I go off on the deep end and I say, you know, it's going to be able to do this, it's going to be able to do that, and I, I talk about it really at the top, at the top end, and they're just like, you, you can't do that, you can't change the world, you can't change this. It's, this person has a um, not a defeatist attitude, but you, you might call it as uh, similar to a defeatist attitude. Who just thinks you know people are far too far gone to to make a better world. You know this person has had people stab them in the back a few times throughout the, their life, and and I'm like, okay, fair enough. But if we don't do anything nothing will change or it will get worse and with the slavery thing in question it was um i think i was trying to google it but i couldn't remember the name i think it it was a small political group which started from nothing and it was called the wiggers i think it was um i I have to google that more later but they started up as a as a fight against slavery and such in the uk and it you know took a while and but you, they got attention. They talked to other MPs. They talked to people, and their, their method was very much like we're talking about. You talking, educating, you teach people philosophy. You, you you basically teach them there is a better way. You know, slavery in a large part, I would say, was along the lines of instant gratification. But the other side of it is actually it's a better way if you're not doing slavery. If people are educated and they actually become part of society and they actually want to be part of that society like okay america when it it, it did the north and south war and such i would say that's part of it you know the the north won because it had full of people who were like well you're not going to be slaves anymore and you get to be part of society instead of being forced to be a um you know a slave force basically and it started, you get to choose what you're going to build, yeah. not be told. Yeah, yeah. And these changes, they start from small things and small groups of people talking about these very things which we're talking about. And uh, it's we, we live in a very, very interesting time, I think, in the um, era of humanity and where... It's um, a lot. I, I'm. I don't know if I've mentioned this before. My thoughts on this. I'll, I'll say it quickly. A lot of technology has changed over the thousand years or whatever. Something changes every fifty to a hundred years. Some, you know, whatever the modes of communication, the modes of transport, and so on. To be fair, the modes of transport took a while to change from horses, um, but money has remained stagnant for a long time. And um, all of the things that can be done with that, and so we we are at a point in change of change of humanity, and with that point of change, I think there will come new 
philosophy or may, maybe old philosophy awakened and you know how how, how we get it out there as, as i mentioned earlier I, I think this class has got uh, a lot of room for growth um something i i'll, I'll quickly mention the as you know there's a, a degree in exeter which is a master's degree teaches fintech and there's a is there's an undergraduate uh, course uh, which teaches bitcoin and five or six years ago you know it, it wasn't even a thought and now they have nearly a thousand students in the undergraduate course and nearly a hundred in the masters which is really really good size for the masters uh, size and um and for the undergraduate module and that's you know it may take a while but that i i don't think it's going to take that long but i i do see us growing and i do see not just us but spaces and such forming from what we are doing and teaching sorry i, I babbled on a bit longer than i planned to fair um it has been an hour and a half how does everyone feel with um the class I think it's been great. Uh, I pretty much have to go now, though. Unfortunately, uh, my my home is awake, and uh, I will soon have to drive my kids to school. Um, so I need to go and and be ready for that. But uh, I think we I, I think it's a good time been to great. end the class then. Yeah, okay. it was great. Yep. Thank you. Well, thank everyone. you very much, um, everybody. Great discussion. I think we we covered off. Uh, a, a lot of really interesting topics and um, you know I think it's been this Gnarled Roots uh, course has been really interesting for me and I've certainly learned a lot about how things that happened you know hundreds and, and even thousands of years ago have set up a, a framework that we still live in today and it it really proves that the actions we take today will echo through future history and it's motivating. And, um, you know, I, I try to use that as much as I can personally as a, a, a stick to kind of whip myself into action and to say that, well, you know, if you, you, we are mortal, you know, we only have, really 70 or 80 years to be effective on this earth and we have and i'm already more than halfway through that and so uh do what we can now and not from the perspective of what is my immediate gratification but from the perspective of what will i look back on when i am at the end of that and be most satisfied with as my own input to what society looks like now. So, yeah. Hallelujah. That's been the most interesting thing. <laughs>